um, and our second speaker is Professor Joanna Mosop. Um, she's a professor at Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Her research focuses on the law of the sea and she has published widely on a range of topics including maritime security, marine biodiversity, the continental shelf regime, dispute settlement and fisheries. Her book, The Continental Shelf Beyond 200 Nautical Miles, Rights and Responsibilities, jointly won the JF Nodi Memorial Prize. Her recent focus has been the new agreement for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. And she was an academic observer on the New Zealand delegation to the negotiations. Together with Professor David Freestone, she is a co-editor of a commentary and analysis of the new agreement that will be published by Oxford University Press in 2024. In 2019, the New Zealand government nominated her to the list of arbitrators and conciliators under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Mm -hmm. Professor Mosop is a member of several editorial boards, including Marine Policy. She has provided training to New Zealand government officials on the law of the sea and has consulted with, with the UNDP on continental shelf issues. She is a visiting professor at the University of Lincoln in the United Kingdom. Joanna, you can take the podium. Thank you very much, Judge um, Joini, and your, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, along with others, I would like to add my thanks to the organisers of this conference for bringing me to Seoul. It's always a pleasure to be here. And before I start, I should also mention that although I was a, a member of the New Zealand delegation, the um, views that I represent here today uh, do not represent the New Zealand government position. So what I'm going to do in the time available to me is I just want to give you a bit of a background. Um, so my focus in this presentation is very much on the regime interaction. From my view, it is that the most important aspect of how the ABMT section will be implemented in the future because we already have a significant number of organisations responsible for various activities. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background uh, to this issue I'm going to briefly take you through the provisions of the BBNJ agreement that refer to um, the regime interaction. And I thought it would be interesting to come up with and discuss a few scenarios uh, to illustrate how some of the issues might arise. And I will conclude. So as already been, has been mentioned um, by a number of speakers today, uh, there was a, a paragraph in the General Assembly Resolution 72249 that authorised the negotiations to begin that the process and its results should not undermine existing relevant legal instruments and frameworks and relevant global, regional and sectoral bodies, which we refer to as IFBs because that is a, an enormous uh, mouthful. So the question that I have is, is what is the relationship between the COP and other IFBs in establishing ABMTs and adopting measures there under? Now I'm sure that the audience will be very aware of the fact that over the years, in a rather ad hoc manner, a number of organisations have been established, both internationally or regionally focused, and they tend to be very much sectorally based. So we have the International Seabed Authority created under UNCLOS that governs mining activities on the deep seabed. We have um, the IMO governing shipping, um, safety and security. There we have the Convention on Biological Diversity, which although refers primarily to areas within national jurisdiction, also has some role to play in the areas beyond that. And then we have the International Whaling Commission, uh, regional fisheries management organisations and regional seas agreements. Now, one of the issues that were identified at the early stages of the discussions um, 
about whether or not a new agreement was required was it was very much pointed out that the fragmentation and very sectorally based approach to governing the ocean had a number of impediments. And while it might be useful for dealing with issues on a sectoral basis, the fragmentation and the lack of coordination among those agencies potentially raised challenges if we were trying to, for example, try to deal with area-based management um, protection measures. Um, and the lack of an institutional framework under the Law of the Sea Convention that allowed states to develop responses to new and emerging issues really was considered to be a, a real problem. And so very early on, many proponents of the BBNJ agreement foresaw that this agreement potentially might fill a gap by creating that institutional framework that might bridge the gaps between the existing organisations. Um, this is a, a wonderful um, image that was published in, in an article this year, and in it the authors mapped the references to other organisations that arose in relation to different issues under the BBNJ. So it, it refers to much more than simply area-based management tools. But what it does show is that when we're dealing with the, the very broad realm of international organisations, um, we're not just talking about law of the sea organisations, but organisations involved in intellectual property, um, international environmental law, trade law, for example. There is the, the BBNJ agreement does sit in this much highly congested um, institutional scenario. However, it was very important for a number of states that the BBNJ process was not going to somehow try and replace all of those organisations, many of which have had many years of practice at regulating um, activities. Of course, the problem for others was that it, we are continuing to see a decline in marine biodiversity um, over, due in part to the fragmented and um, sometimes uh, inadequate approaches that some organisations take to, to protecting marine biodiversity, some of them may not even have that as a high priority. So the um, obligation not to undermine, uh, there was a range of different perspectives on how that might be implemented in practice. At one end, of the, you know, the very globalist approach, um, there was a real uh, push to allow the COP of BBNJ to create um, area-based management tools, MPAs, with measures if there is an IFB in place but doesn't act in relation to certain um, proposals. So that would have been a very interventionist approach on the part of the BBNJ COP. At the other end of the spectrum, um, there was a, 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 a view that if an IFB exists, then that was simply off the table for the COP to consider. And one example of how that came about was um, that it, there was a pr proposal that anything to do with fisheries would be excluded from um, the agreement altogether, which would have included, obviously, ABMTs. Um, but the more, I guess, reasonable end of, uh, version of that was simply that the COP can't uh, intervene uh, or create measures where there is an IFB that has responsibility. So, how was this articulated in the final text? Well, there are a number of provisions in um, part one of the agreement that refer to the not undermining provision. Uh, Article five, paragraph two, repeats the obligation not that this treaty would not be applied in a manner that would undermine existing um, instruments, frameworks, and bodies although it does also add that the um, agreement should be interpreted in a way that promotes coherence co um, and coordination with those IFBs. And I think that reflects um, the, the view that many took that the new agreement was going to be able to perhaps fill in some of the coordination problems that may have existed prior. Article 8 in relation to international cooperation refers to the idea that um, parties that are part, uh, parties to the BBNJ agreement um, should encourage and enhance cooperation among existing IFBs. 
Um, so this was the idea that the cooperation should extend and include existing IFBs and the BBNJ. And the second paragraph is aimed more directly at the individual parties, and it says that parties shall endeavour to promote as appropriate the objectives of the agreement when participating in other IFBs. Now, you notice that that is quite qualified. So it's an endeavour, an effort, to promote as appropriate um, and the objectives, so nothing to do with particular measures. Um, but of course, this was in relation to the agreement as a whole, and as we'll see, uh, there's a far stronger obligation in relation to area-based management tools. Moving on to the process for the establishment of ABMTs, I haven't, uh, there's a quite a lengthy set of provisions here. In relation to proposals for ABMTs, the information must be included about consultations with any relevant IFBs. And I think it's pretty clear that any serious proposals for ABMTs will have undertaken significant um, consultation with those organisations in order to come up with the proposal um, and the measures that are being suggested. But there is also another step in the process in that uh, those IFBs are to be given an opportunity to provide information on a range of different issues, including um, their views on the proposals, any information about existing science, and what sort of measures they might have in place. And then we get to the decision making, and this is where I think uh, probably the most crucial element of the regime interaction comes into place. Um, so the conference of the parties can um, take three types of decisions under, under the agreement. First, they can take decisions to establish area-based management tools, including marine protected areas and related measures. So they have the power to create ABMTs and impose measures. The next two paragraphs speak to the relationship with other IFBs. Um, the second paragraph tells us that they may take decisions on measures compatible with those adopted under IFBs in cooperation and coordination with those instruments, frameworks and bodies. So there's an obligation to collaborate even at this point uh, about potential compatible measures. Um, and this, I think, um, sort of leads us sort of halfway between those two extremes that I showed on the slide earlier. And probably most importantly, um, paragraph C says that where proposed measures are within the competence of IFBs, the COP may make recommendations uh, in relation to measures that might be adopted under those um, IFBs. So that is a very clear statement that within, when something is within the competence, uh, it is up to the IFB to decide whether or not those measures would be put in place under their auspices. You can't read paragraph one without also reading paragraph two. Um, and again, the obligation not to undermine is repeated, and I'm sure that this was uh, partly in response to the inclusion of paragraph B in um, paragraph one, um, so that where you're talking about compatibility, it's still subject to the, the instruction that um, the competences of IFBs must be respected and um, not undermined uh, in any decisions by the COP. Now, of course, that leads to a number of questions of interpretation. And one would be, what does it mean um, to where a, an IFB has a, is within the, sorry, a proposed measure is within the competence of an IFB? Now, courts and tribunals over the years have developed a, a, a series of decisions and case law considering what the powers of various international organisations are. And there are two uh, prevailing approaches to determining the powers of an organisation. One is based on a, a, an interpretation of the instrument itself and what the instrument t says, the constituent instrument says about the powers of that body. And the second approach is uh, the implied powers approach. And in the certain activities case, um, the court found that an international organisation must be deemed to have the powers um, that, although not provided for in the, in that case, the charter, are conferred on it by necessary implication as being essential to the performance of its duties. So if you take an implied powers approach, then that does, would potentially um, lead to a relatively wide definition of competence. 
although in the nuclear activities advisory opinion, the ICJ took a slightly narrower approach in determining that the WHO did not have the power to ask for an advisory opinion about the legality of the use of nuclear weapons because it wasn't directly related to their competence, which was around the effects of um, health, health effects, essentially. So we've got some existing international law that may help us determine um, competency, uh, it, and, but as I'm mentioning, there is a little bit of a debate and some tension about what competence might mean, so whether it's determined narrowly or more broadly will have an obvious impact on whether or not a COP is undermining or um, making decisions within the competence of a body. For example, if an RFMO has made a decision not to regulate certain activities, um, but could, if it wanted to, regulate certain activities, at what point does the competence uh, is the competent is, is a decision about the non-regulated activities within the competence of that RFMO. So we can see the potential for quite a lot of uh, discussion and debate about how that particular provision is applied. Um, and a similar issue may arise in relation to questions about what compatibility means, although it's clear from the wording there that the, um, the IFB is in, it has to be involved in that decision and so presumably would have some um, discretion in order to, to help determine whether something was compatible or not. Moving along, um, I think another really important part of Article 22 is Paragraph 3. Um, and this is the obligation, and it says, shall make arrangements for regular consultations to enhance co cooperation and coordination among IFBs. Um, so this, I think, is, is where the potential for um, building those um, bridges across the gaps in the institutional framework really has the potential to, um, to make quite a, a big difference, in my view. Um, paragraph four um, was, Renee referred to the debate as to whether or not there should be a, a mechanism to recognize existing ABMTs under other IFBs. There is a door that is cracked open to allow the COP to do that in the future if they decide that it, um, it's appropriate. Um, finally, uh, where a, an IFB may not have existed prior to the decisions of the COP and subsequently comes into existence, it's interesting that the process is not that the, anything that overlaps with that IFB comes to an end. In fact, paragraph 7 says that those, any measures that overlap will continue in existence until the conference of the party has an opportunity to review and um, consider how the relationship between the new instrument and the BBNJ measures uh, will, will occur. There is provisions um, also in emergency measures. So um, emergency measures under co the COP can only take place if they overlap with a, an IFB. If it's clear after consultation with the IFB that timely response is not possible under that IFB, then the COP will have an, can have a role in putting in place emergency measures. So, so that's an interesting um, development. So if there's, uh, there's, there's no way that the IFB is able to respond in, in the same amount of time the COP can, then potentially um, the COP could make engage in emergency measures which might um, infringe or move into the competence of an IFB. Now Article 25 is also um, really, really interesting and really useful. So paragraph 4 um, says that parties shall promote as appropriate the adoption of measures within um, IFBs uh, to support the implementing of the decisions and recommendations made by the conference of the parties. That is a much stronger statement than what appears in Article 8. Um, it does include the words as appropriate, so there is some wiggle room, but it is very much a sense that the role of the parties to the BBNJ doesn't end at the BBNJ, but reflects the fact that parties will be party to other agreements and that they are able to take that, um, to advocate for those measures in that other body. Paragraph 6 tells us that a party um, that is not a party to another IFB or, um, or framework is not discharged from the obligation to cooperate. Um, so it doesn't mean that a party can't 
uh, can just go off and do whatever it likes. Obviously, there is um, still an obligation to cooperate, although uh, under international law, the obligation to cooperate uh, is largely procedural and doesn't imply any particular outcome. So just to summarise, uh, all of um, the COP can't undermine IFBs in establishing ABMTs or measures. Um, and the competence of the IFB is going to determine whether or not the COP can make decisions or recommendations. Um, there is going to be, I think, a lot of importance tied up in the coordination cooperation among IFBs. And I think it is significant that states that are party to BBNJ will have obligations to promote and support the implementation of COP decisions and recommendations in other IFBs. So, I've taken you through the text. What does that mean in practice? I've come up with three scenarios that might stimulate some conversation and discussions to try to give you an idea of how all of this might work in practice. And I think it also helps to identify some of the potential downfalls um, in the way in which the um, relationship between BB&J and IFBs um, might arise. So, the, my first scenario was probably the most detailed um, of the three. Uh, and, of course, this is the idea that um, there might be some high seas EBSAs designated under the Convention on Biological Diversity. A number of states would like to turn that into an ABMT. And I've, I've been using ABMT as including marine protected areas. So it might be a marine protected area, or it might be an um, ABMT. Uh, and we, if we assume that existing activities include shipping, cruise ships, fishing, some dumping of waste... Um, and the parties want to do a number of things. They want to pre prevent discharges or dumping of any type from any vessels in the area and, as well, measures to avoid collision with marine mammals, um, restrictions on the type of fishing gear, and also limitations on any new uses of the ocean um, that may cause harm. What this scenario shows us is that we have a number of existing organisations that have some competence or almost total competence in respect of some of the proposed measures that um, are being put forward. Um, and, but I think what I'm trying to show on this slide is that there's not always been coordination among those organisations. So they've tended to be quite separate in their decision making and their, um, their implementation. The fact that the BBNJ is now here offers a new opportunity to enhance cooperation and coordination among these organisations. And of course, this is the process set out in Article um, 22, Paragraph 3, where the BBNJ shall undertake um, cooperation and coordination. Now, in this slide, I've got arrows going from the BBNJ to the various individual organisations. But actually, I think if I was going to be more correct, this slide would also have arrows pointing in directions of each other. So what this potentially, we can potentially see is a mechanism where those individual organisations who may not previously have talked to one another potentially could be exchanging information in a group. Um, so it's not just going between the BB&J and an organisation, but between all of those organisations. And for me, this is one of the most um, promising areas that we could potentially have um, under this organisation. Now, I, I think that in addition to wanting to create coordination among the organisations themselves, another real opportunity would be bringing together the scientific bodies of all of those organisations as well. We have seen in some situations where regional bodies have tried to cooperate in order to recognise area-based management tools or MPAs, that often the sort of science needed in one organisation is very different to the science needed in another organisation. But if you bring scientists together, focusing on a particular region or area, um, potentially in an SEA process even, um, then the, science, the potential for cooperation and coordination among science, I think, actually has a huge um, potential benefit uh, to you know, ultimately seeing implementation of BB&J recommendations in those other bodies. Another aspect of this that I wanted to just touch on um, is, of course, the individual state membership of different organisations. And it will be the case that 
parties to the BBNJ will also be party to other organisations. And I just wanted to give you a very simple diagram to show you how this might um, play out. And apologies for the rather uh, juvenile graphics, but I'm on my, my skill is not in graphic design. Um, so State A, for example, might be a party to the BBNJ agreement, but also to the CBD and the IMO. State B may not be party to BBNJ, but may be party um, to CBD, IMO, and an RFMO. State C might be party to the RFMO, BBNJ, and the CBD. So there's a rather complex um, intersection of various obligations under those different treaties. What does the BBNJ treaty tell us about what has to happen from the perspectives of each of these states? Well, um, for states A and C, who are party to the BBNJ agreement, obviously there is an obligation to promote measures to support implementation of BBNJ decisions and recommendations. Does that mean that state C, uh, if there is a proposal for an MPA and the COP says we think that the RFMO should stop fishing in this area, should then go and, and vote for that, or, um, or certainly if it's not on the agenda of the organisation, then they would probably have to put the item onto the agenda of the other organisation. And then the obligation is as appropriate to promote the objectives of uh, the measures um, adopted by the COP. State B, of course, is under no such obligation to promote BBNJ um, decisions because it is not a party to the convention, although uh, Renee did clearly pointed out that there are obviously other obligations, including obligations under the UNCLOS, to cooperate and so forth. Um, they may also be under obligations from the UN Fish Stocks Agreement to, um, to, co um, to cooperate. And then um, State A, um, sorry, I think I may have <laughs> mixed that up. Um, so there is also the obligation to um, cooperate for State A if they are not a party to uh, the Regional Fisheries Management Organisation. They are not discharged from the obligation to cooperate under um, the convention. So what I'm trying to do with this sort of example is just to show you that it's not going to be an easy and straightforward process in a scenario such as the one I proposed to to go from a proposal through to measures that address all of the potential, um, potential issues. Depending on the decision-making process within the IFB, it might be that the IFB decides not to implement recommendations or to, um, it might f fully reject the idea that the COP um, has presented or it might undertake its own measures that it feels is um, suitably um, equivalent to those undertaken by the COP. Um, scenario B, um, I am slightly more simple, um, is where we have a group of states that want to establish a marine protected area in an area where the International Seabed Authority has granted exploration rights of seabed mining. There is a RFMO that governs, governs fishing for tuna, but not for other stocks. So what is the ability of the COP in this case um, in relation to the establishment of an ABMT? Well, first of all, we know that it has the ability to establish the ABMT and come up with measures so long as those are not within the competence of another organisation. Now, what that does mean is that the International Seabed Authority um, has the competence to decide the allocation of mining measures in that area. However, parties, uh, it might be that, for example, the COP recommends to the ISA to consider whether or not there should be some protected areas within that, um, that mining, so that would have to be then taken up with the ISA and it would be subject to the ISA rules about whether or not that is possible. Um, if the COP wanted um, to address non-tuna stocks, presumably that is not within the competence of the tuna RFMO and potentially the COP could establish measures um, in relation to fishing for other species uh, as well. So, um, so I think in that situation, there would be perhaps a bit more room for the COP to come up with applicable measures. And my last scenario is actually motivated a little bit by a recent meeting that's just been held uh, where the IMO is exploring the possibility of establishing particularly sensitive sea areas on, um, in areas of the high seas. Um, 
and p potentially that was initially designed to protect a sensitive area from sh fish from shipping. Um, but its members are concerned that potentially activity from fishing vessels are also a threat to what has been identified as a sensitive area, and there is an RFMO in place. What would that involve? Well, first of all, you'll note that this doesn't necessarily involve any measures from COP. There's um, not necessarily a proposal under the BB&J agreement to establish a marine protected area. However, um, there is an option that one way of doing that might be to, to take an issue or a proposal for a broader area-based management tool to the BBNJ agreement and use the facilitative approaches that are available under the BBNJ to try to bring in relevant organisations um, as well as um, uh, potentially science and so forth. So what I'm just been trying to do is just to, and there are many, many other scenarios that one could imagine, including, for example, what if uh, an IFB was established subsequent to the BBNJ, but not all parties, want, states thought it was um, legitimate, what would the responsibility of the COP be in that circumstance? So there's a lot of questions, I think, at this stage. What it means, I think, is that there is a very clear instruction in the BB&J agreement that it has a limited role where other IFBs exist. A lot of uh, this, the, the, the practicalities of implementation are really going to come down to what it means that when something is within the competence and what it means when something is compatible. I think that um, even though we do have quite strong limitations on what the COP can do when other IFBs exist, there is, I think, mechanisms there which do mean that you could potentially see development in ways that you might not otherwise had um, if BB&J was not around. And, and this can essentially be put down to the obligation to um, undertake consultation and coordination, but also the obligations that individual state parties will have to promote measures within the um, IFB. And I just wanted to also f finish by saying that we don't necessarily have to wait until the COP, uh, until the treaty enters into force and the COP comes into effect. Um, really, it would be um, interesting if a group of states, either through a preparatory committee or some other form of um, agreement, could potentially put in place some consultations at an earlier stage to identify where some of these proposals might end up so that when the COP gets into um, effect, we're ready to go and have proposals on the board um, ready to be discussed. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Well done, well done. Um, your presentation has raised quite a number of um, important points. <laughs> and, uh, I was looking at your scenario B, which is quite interesting, um, having a situation where um, the uh, conference of the parties uh, can maybe decide to establish <laughs> a marine protected area um, in um, um, an area which is under the International Seabed Authority. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting uh, scenario. But well done. Thank you very much.